Hello, today I'll be talking to you about, as Leanne said, what do people need to know about communication after brain injury, particularly looking at the views of people with brain injury and their support, supporters. So what do we already know about communication after brain injury? We know that changes to our brain can impact our cog cognitive functions, so our thinking skills. And then these impaired cognitive functions can impact on the way that we communicate. So we can define this as cognitive communication disorder. So as you can see there, we've got something's happened to our brain, it's not working like it used to, and it changes the way that we communicate with others. So let's have a look at the characteristics of cognitive communication disorder. Focusing on how changes in some particular areas of cognitive function can actually manifest or present in how we communicate. So if someone has an impairment with their memory, we might see this as um, when they're communicating, they might be really repetitive and repeating ideas or even whole conversations and stories. If they've got an impairment in their attention and speed of thinking, we might see this as them having difficulty staying on topic. And if they have difficulties with their problem solving, their reasoning and their self-monitoring, um, this can present as excessive talkativeness or inappropriate humour. So the impact of cognitive communication disorder goes beyond just affecting the way that we communicate with others. We know that um, the impact of cognitive communication disorder has a significant effect on our quality of life, not just for the person with brain injury, but also for their family members. And not just at the time of brain injury, but across their whole lifespan. People with cognitive communication disorders are also at quite a high risk of losing family and friend relationships. And it can impact their job stability as well. We also know that family members also experience feelings of stress and burden. So, so far, the information I've shared with you is information that we've gathered through doing lots of research. But I guess our research here really focuses on hearing what do people with brain injury actually want us to know? And what do their supporters want us to know as well? So the aim of our study was to explore the experiences, perceptions, needs and wants of people with brain injury, their family members and other multidisciplinary health professionals that are involved in the care and support of people with brain injury. So we did a qualitative, we did a study using a qualitative method, um, using semi-structured interviews, which we then transcribed and used thematic analysis to come up with some main themes that, have, that had come through what our um, participants had shared with us. So we had a total of 22 participants. So this included five people with traumatic brain injury, four family members of people with brain injury. We had four speech pathologists with lots of experience of working in brain injury, four health professionals who uh, were an OT, a physio, a psychologist, and a client services manager. And we also had five support workers. So from these interviews, we found that there were four key themes. The first one being, a brain injury changes the way you communicate. Conversations after brain injury can be challenging for the both of us. In positive conversations, we are purposeful about making it equal. And the nature of brain injury means that we need tailored um, education and training. So let's look a little bit deeper into each of these themes um, and I'll share some quotes from the interviews that our participants have um, given us. So the first theme, a brain injury changes the way that you communicate. The one of the sub-themes that came up from there was that brain injuries can impact our social skills. So we had one of our participants with brain injury share with us that when they're in a conversation, for example, others might make a joke. And in that situation, they say, they might think they're being funny, and I take it literally. So they have trouble understanding humour in social interactions. Another sub-theme that came up was that 
changes in cognitive skills impact our communication after brain injury. So this links back to what I was talking, to, uh, talking about in the beginning. And let's hear from the perspective of a psychologist. So I think from a psychological point of view, it's the impulse control issues within language that they have trouble with. So just wanting to blurt out whatever they've got to say and not structuring it in a way that's helpful. Our second theme, conversations after brain injury can be challenging for the both of us. So we found, we learnt that conversations can be really frustrating. So we had a support worker share. It's hard because you don't know if it's because they don't, just, they don't like you or because they're overwhelmed or if it's just their way of communicating. And this is about someone that had struggled to um, share lots of information and contribute equally in a conversation. We've learnt that a lack of understanding can lead to negative experiences. So a family member shared with us that they just don't understand them. So then the exchanges they have are kind of abrasive and not helpful. So this is about other people who don't understand the brain injury trying to communicate with their loved ones. We know that these negative experiences can then lead to feelings of anxiety and uncertainty. So one of our participants with brain injury shared that they feel anxious um, in this situation. So if they're fast talkers, that because that's hard for me to take it in. And if they come across abrupt, it makes me feel anxious. And we know now as well that unequal contributions lead to unsatisfying conversations. And a speech pathologist summed it up like this. So taking away from the balance of an interaction or diminishing that sense of balance by being too overbearing or demanding within a conversation. And this can be either the person with brain injury or a communication partner. In our third theme, so this is around positive conversations and how we need to make purposeful effort about making them equal. In a positive conversation, you feel understood. So one of our participants with brain injury really wanted to emphasise and let us know to actually listen to it and honestly take it all in. Like, if they're talking about their house, understand that they're passionate about their house. Patience was a really big theme that came through. And we had a social worker share, patience is one thing. It's going to take time for conversations to start and to know whether the information is getting through. So that's one big thing, patience. Each person needs to have equal contribution. And we had a family member share what this means to them. So what I would classify as having a good conversation is, where not only are you heard, but you're also getting the same feedback in return. And using we can all use strategies to make conversation better. So we had a wife share. I've kind of learned to try and deliver my message across differently. Our last theme <coughs> looked at the nature of education and training. So what our participants really wanted us to get across in terms of content was that every brain injury is different. One of the health professionals shared, there's no two patients the same. And I can tell you that in 50 years I've seen similar, but it doesn't mean to say that the same thing is going to work. A brain injury can be invisible. A family member shares the public would not really know that there was something wrong, and that's kind of difficult to try and deal with. And we've learnt that there is not enough training and education. Another family member sharing, I wish I knew then what I know now. I think that would not only be better for me, dad, everyone around him, but I wish I knew even just half of what I knew now. And when it comes to um, an online and a digital um, training and, and education and intervention, we learnt that the education needs to be engaging, um, not just in terms of content, but also delivery. So people really wanted to know strategies, different strategies, what doesn't work and what does work in real life, and the importance of it being interactive. Interactive ways where you can click on things or move it across yourself or try to rate yourself or for the user to make decisions about what's good or what's bad. So where does this take us? We already know that communication and um, intervention after brain injury needs to involve the person with brain injury and their communication partners. 
But what our findings add to this is that in terms of um, developing content for communication partner training, we need to make sure that we're helping people understand the brain injury itself and the communication changes after a brain injury, that everyone has some problems with conversation. So not just the person with brain injury, but their communication partners as well. And that the strategies we use to improve conversations need to be practical, individualised and collaborative. In terms of delivering this information in a digital health space, um, we've learnt that it needs to be really engaging. So how do we do this? We can do this by using videos that um, we're not just watching, we can interact with. We can use audio, we can incorporate quizzes and also reflective questions as well, where people get to an opportunity to think about what might actually work for me. Opportunities to role play and practice and um, making sure that there are also self-directed modules which people can do in their own time and pace. So very soon you'll get to hear from Liz and Rachel who will, I guess, show you how we've used this information to try um, and develop some interventions and education and training um, resources. Thank you very much. Keep going, but thanks for that comment. Um, our next uh, presentation is going to be quite brief, but we've got um, Liz Sprunner and Rachel Redake, who are both going to present uh, about what we've done. We've started to build this thing called the Social Brain Toolkit, and they're both postdocs with us in the Acquired Brain Injury Communication Lab. Over to you two. All right, <laughs> wonderful. I think maybe if I stand here, is that better? Or is it still, no, that's okay. Excellent. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. So, um, so my name is Rachel and I'm presenting here with Liz on behalf of our um, team who've developed the Social Brain Toolkit. We'd also like to um, acknowledge that we have done this work in partnership with Brain Injury Australia and with funding support from iCare New South Wales. So what we'll be doing today is giving you a very brief overview of the Social Brain uh, Toolkit. And this slide outlines the phases um, of the research that we've undertaken. So Petra's already shared with you a little of our collaborative design phase, where we asked for input uh, from uh, people with a brain injury, from their family members, from clinicians who are experts in this space. Um, and their input really helped us to develop uh, and design the tools. Then we moved on to a build phase where we worked with some tech partners um, to develop prototypes of the tools. We then moved on to a pilot phase where we've trialled the tools with small numbers of participants. And finally, uh, finished with an implementation phase where we've made the tools available and collected data on how they've been used. So the Social Brain Toolkit contains three tools which are all aimed at better communication after acquired brain injury. So we'll briefly explain today what the tools are and show you some of the features. So firstly, I'll share with you about Conversability. So Conversability is an online program for a person with an ABI and their family member or carer to complete together. So the program includes self-guided activities that sort of focus on some of those elements that Petra highlighted were important about communication as well as uh, building into the platform the ability to have video calls with the speech pathologist. And the aim, sorry, the aim of the program is having better conversations together. And here you can see some of the features of the program. So on the left of this slide, you can see here one of the videos that we developed, sort of um, unpacking one of those elements of positive communication. And you can see here on the right of the slide an example of a practice task where the person with a brain injury and their communication partner could practice a particular communication strategy and upload it to the platform to get some feedback from their speech pathologist. So next I'll hand over to Liz to share about some of the other tools in the toolkit. Maybe see. Hello. 
Uh, so the second tool that I get to talk to you about is social ability. And this is really designed for people with a brain injury. And so the course is all about learning about social media, how to use it, how to stay safe, and how to enjoy it and be able to connect with other people. So the aim of it really is to support safe and successful social, social media use. So in the course, you can see on the left-hand side is just a bit of a screenshot of the login page. But in the course, there's four key modules. So uh, what is social media? Staying safe in social media. How do I use it? And who can I connect with? And in these modules, there's um, a combination of simple written information, um, lots of videos, and also some questions for people to work through. And um, there's a screenshot of one of the videos up on the right-hand side that's talking about finding people or information that could help you to use social media. Um, and at the bottom on the right-hand side is an example of the certificate of completion so people can work through the course in their own time. They can do it by themselves or they can have someone support them to do it and they can come in and out of the course and do it in their own time and work towards finishing it. The next um, tool is interactability and like social ability it's an online course but this one is um, a self-guided course for people who'd like to learn more about interacting with someone with a brain injury so this could be um, for family, friends, carers, health professionals, support workers, anyone who would like to know more about having good conversations. Um, so it covers background information uh, about brain injury and the modules actually provide some specific skills and strategies to support successful interactions. So the aim is to um, improve success in conversations and also to improve confidence in having those conversations with people with a brain injury. One of the key features, um, you can see a screenshot there on the right hand side, is we've got videos that we've um, worked with people with brain injury to create and they share uh, some of their advice on their top tips for having good conversations with them. Uh, again, like social ability, you can get a certificate of completion at the end and um, we think it's pretty good. Uh, so this is just some information on how to actually access them. So social ability and interactability are freely available now. Um, so the, you can either use the QR codes there at the bottom or go via those uh, links. But we actually have a little table, uh, I want to say just over there. Um, so it's near one of the food tables, so it's a good spot. Um, so come and talk to us if you want to find out a little bit more about any of these tools. We're also hosting some Zoom events in July, and so the two little links on the bottom right are for those two, some information about what we're going to be doing at those launch events. That's right, and you can also um, register and get the recording afterwards um, if you're not available. So I think that wraps us up and yeah. we'll hand back to Leanne. Vee Brassel. And she's going to talk to us about um, using virtual reality. So we're starting to get interested in virtual reality at the University of Sydney. And uh, Sophie's leading the way. She has nearly finished her PhD as well. So I'm going to have to finish um, by the end of the year, right? And um, hopefully, hopefully. No, not hopefully. <laughs> It you will just, happen. You just are. So, um, yeah, Sophie's going to um, talk to us about some of her PhD work. So I'll hand over to Thanks, you. Thanks, Leanne. Um, so, hi, everyone. As Leanne said, I'll be talking to you about um, parts of my PhD. And we've been looking at using virtual reality in rehabilitation for communication after brain injury. So when we talk about VR in simple terms, it's a computer generated virtual environment that a user can interact with. So as you can see on screen, there's a woman who's wearing a virtual reality headset and this is the type that we're actually using in our research um, and she's holding hand controllers. Um, but there's actually kind of a, a spectrum. So when we talk about VR, we can classify it according to different levels of immersion. So that's technically how much you feel like you're in the virtual world 
as opposed to the real world because of the equipment that you are using. So you can see on the furthest end we have immersive VR, so you're wearing a headset and when you're wearing the headset it blocks out the real world. Whereas on the other side we've got what we call non-immersive VR, so that includes things like computer games and video games, um, but when you're using it you can still sense that you are in the real world. And somewhere in the middle we have semi-immersive VR, so that refers to things such as bigger projection screens uh, and simulators. So there's an image there of a driving simulator. And our research is mainly focused on using immersive VR. So I have a video here of what virtual reality could look like. It's just one example. So there is no sound, but you will see uh, what we call avatars. So these are actually people who are wearing a headset um, and they're able to interact with, with each other within the virtual environment. So just a bit of background to VR and healthcare. So the use of VR in healthcare has been researched for almost 30 years now and early applications were often used in psychology, so for treatment of phobias, um, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but there has been a big increase in VR research and use more recently and particularly in the last few years because of COVID, it's been quite hard to keep up with the research that's uh, coming out. Um, but other users include education and training of healthcare professionals, use as a tool for pain reduction, um, distraction from medical procedures, but also for patient education, so to teach them about their health conditions. And there are many reasons that VR is being used in healthcare, so this includes that it's seen as a motivating and engaging tool, and it can generate lifelike virtual environments that represent scenarios that you might not be able to access in real world clinical practice. And it's also been used as a telehealth tool so people can access services um, if they have difficulties attending face-to-face -face appointments, um, and some research came out about that um, during COVID as well. So in terms of virtual reality and brain injury, um, as I said earlier, non-immersive VR, semi-immersive VR and immersive VR has been used uh, for stroke. So lots of areas including for balance, for upper limb rehabilitation, spatial neglect, walking, uh, practicing everyday activities, for example, um, getting dressed or making something in the kitchen uh, and for cognition. Um, Computer-based VR has been used for virtual reality, uh, sorry, for communication disorders after a stroke. Um, and in terms of traumatic brain injury, again, uh, different areas have been researched, um, such as balance, memory, attention, cognitive fatigue and stress and anxiety. But there is nothing out there um, for assessing or treating cognitive communication disorders after a TBI. And that's, I guess, what my PhD is looking at. Now, most of these studies do show that VR is effective, um, but more research is needed. So with bigger participant groups uh, and the quality of the research also needs to be improved. For example, better reporting of the findings. So how do we actually develop VR for brain injury rehabilitation? Well, the research tells us that people with lived experience of TBI and healthcare workers should be included in developing VR for use in rehab. So first we need to gather their ideas. So what do they think VR could be used for? Uh, what they think the benefits could be, but also any risks or challenges. And following this, uh, we can use their ideas to help design VR applications or tasks and then test these designs with small groups of people. So looking for whether they like the design, uh, whether they don't like it, what the issues are and any ways that we can make it better. And then from there, the final step is to test that final design um, and compare it against non-virtual reality therapies um, and with big participant groups. So we're using parts of this process uh, early on um, to guide research for using VR in communication rehabilitation after TBI. So we wanted to find out how VR can be used 
in rehabilitation for communication disorders after a brain injury. So we asked 14 speech pathologists and three VR specialists um, who work with sorry, the speech pathologists work with people with brain injury. Um, we asked them about their ideas for using VR, what they saw as potential benefits, risks and challenges, um, and what supports they would need to be able to implement VR in clinical practice. And we gathered this information um, by conducting online focus groups and interviews. So here are the results. So overall, the participants had positive views about uh, the potential of VR in communication rehab after a brain injury. Um, they thought that it was an exciting technology that might be appealing to people who have a TBI and the clinicians working with them. And the ideas for use were mainly related to assessing or practicing communication skills in lifelike scenarios. So having a virtual environment where you could go and practice communicating at a cafe or a restaurant or navigating public transport, for example, um, workplaces, that was a big one that participants discussed as well. And many thought that VR could provide opportunities for repeated practice of therapy goals um, and it could be a motivating and enjoyable way um, to practice as well. However, the participants um, said that potential barriers and risks um, need to be considered when implementing VR um, and this includes the fact that People might have limited knowledge, so training and education will be needed. Um, it's also important to think about safety, not only when actually using the VR, so you don't want to be in a space that's kind of constricted or there's tripping hazards, um, but there is a very, very small risk of um, what we call VR sickness, for example, motion sickness. So just keeping in mind that that's something um, to monitor, but also the technology these days is has really, really improved. So that is a really, really small risk as well. And we do our best to minimise that by looking at apps and designing apps that won't hopefully um, induce that in people. And I guess a big point was that the participants said that VR could be a tool to supplement practice and it's not something that's going to replace current practice. And they also said that it, it, it is important to test VR um, with people who have lived experience of TBI. So our next step is to actually trial off-the-shelf apps with people who have a traumatic brain injury um, and social communication problems, as well as speech pathologists. And we really want to find out what they like about the apps, what they don't like about them, um, if they have any further ideas for how we could use VR, um, how comfortable they feel when they are using it. Um, and we want to look at whether conversation skills of people with a brain injury are different in a virtual reality environment compared to a non-virtual reality environment. And thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sophie. Any questions yeah. about VR? I don't know if anyone's That's just right. using VR or but <laughs> if you are interested, oh I have three S's in my surname, that is incorrect. <laughs> uh -huh. Um feel free to contact me. Um if you are a clinician or know of someone with a TBI who's interested in our research as well. Yeah, we are recruiting at the moment, so yeah, uh, yeah we'd love to hear from yeah, you. Yeah, and we do have flyers at our table, um, as Rachel mentioned, or Liz mentioned earlier, so we mm -hmm. will be here tomorrow as well. Yes, one question. Do you compensate people, like, pay your participants that are providing that good experience? Yes, yes we, do. we do. Yeah, yeah we yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think that's pretty important. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that's the end of today's um, session. Thank you for your being so engaging and asking questions and being so involved. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. I think it's the movie is the next thing on the agenda. So.